This is the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. I'm so excited for this week's episode because we are tackling a very important topic, but also one that we haven't touched on to date on this show. And that is the effect that a plant-based diet can have on the environment. And with that, we welcome to the program Dr. Neil Barnard. Welcome back. Thank you, Chuck. Great to be back with you. I had no idea until... I mean, I started working here that there was such a correlation between what we eat and the environment. We always think that it's our cars and sitting in traffic and factories that are responsible for 100 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. But that is not the case. You know, the, the food choices that people make have an enormous impact on the environment in so many ways. And if you don't mind, actually, let me let me let me take you with me to where I grew up. Let's go. I, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. OK. And when I go out there and visit. I'm always amazed. Um, right outside of town, it's acre after acre after acre of corn. Mm. And it's beautiful. You know, every corn stalk is identical. Um, and it's as far as the eye can see in these beautiful artistic rows. But then it hits you, wait a minute. First of all, the reason they're identical is because they're genetically engineered. And the second thing is that no human being is going to touch one ear of that corn. It's all cattle feed or chicken feed or feed for hogs. So an enormous amount of, of corn um, is grown just to feed animals, not to feed people. And on the other side of the, the highway, you'll see soybeans. As far as the eye can see, and nobody is making tofu out of that. That's genetically engineered soy for animal feed. Here's the problem. You've got to irrigate it. Um, so it takes a whole lot of water. You have to fertilize it, so it's a lot of nitrogen going into it. And then the uh, and pesticides and herbicides are used as well. So as it's irrigated, then the nitrogen trickles off the fields into the little streams. Mm -hmm. And the pesticides and fertilizer starts washing downstream. And it, in, in that neck of the woods, some of it goes up toward Canada. Some, some of it in North Dakota ends up in the Missouri River and then the Mississippi River. And as it accumulates from all the other streams and rivers going into the Mississippi, you have this huge overgrowth of algae growing because of all the fertilizers going into the water. Wow. The algae then die off and end up destroying uh, life forms in the water. And th the whole system flushes out just like a toilet wow. underneath Texas and Louisiana. And there is a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico as big as the state of New Jersey. Um, dead because of the overuse of fertilizer that has caused this overgrowth of algae that then, then dies out. Um, and environmentalists have known this is a huge problem. It starts with that ear of corn that was there to, to feed a cow or feed a chicken, and it required fertilizer and, and irrigation and pesticides. That is quite the trickle-down effect. That it's, is staggering. It's, it's staggering. And you think, okay, what if... I wasn't eating, uh, what, what if I'm not eating chickens or pigs or, 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 or cows or whatever? You still got to eat, right? but you're eating the plants directly instead of feeding all that corn to a cow and then eating the tiny bit of food that comes out. And I have to say, I've concluded that if you are not, an, if you are not following a vegan diet, you're not an environmentalist. Mm. You are just not. And, and I'm not the first person to have said this. Um, Francis Moore LePay wrote a half a century ago in Diet for a Small Planet, the idea that if people would eat plants directly, we'd need a whole lot fewer plants yeah. um, than if you feed them to animals. And that means less irrigation, less fertilizer, less pesticides, a much cleaner uh, planet. And not to mention the fact that then you could feed more people if you wanted to. Absolutely. We're going to touch on that in just a second. Um, I'm a numbers guy. I love numbers. I love to be able to quantify things. So there was this big report that was published in The Lancet earlier this year, and they said that those researchers, very, very smart people, much smarter than I, uh, said that 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed directly to food production. Yes. That's a third. That That's a pretty high amount. And you were also talking about the amount of water that's used in these fields for irrigation. They also stated that it, it takes 1,800 gallons of water to produce just one pound, one pound of beef. Yeah, it's, it's huge. And it's not that the cow is drinking that much water. 
To an extent they do, but much of it is how much water you have to apply to all the fields to grow the, cor the, the corn or other feed grains that go into their bodies. Mm. Um, and the same is true with chicken, I have to say. Um, the numbers are, are slightly different, but chickens are not ordering room service. They're eating feed grains that were grown with irrigation and fertilizer and so forth. So, so uh, if you're a, a poultry eater, you're part of the environmental problem. All right, think about this. You go to McDonald's, people will order the quarter pounder. Given those numbers that we just talked about, 1,800 gallons roughly for one pound of beef, that's 450 gallons of water it would take for one quarter pounder. Think about going to the grocery store and going down the water aisle and seeing 450 gallon jugs of water. Right. That is a lot of water. It, it sure is. It's a lot of water. It's a lot of pesticides. It's a lot of fertilizer. And it is it is hurting this, uh, the earth. Um, the report that you were talking about, yeah. it appeared, it, it, they pulled together a commission called the EAT e -A -T Lancet Commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they came up with several different different findings. Um, not only are, could you save the environment, but you could also save lives if people would go toward a plant-based diet. They felt that um, that increasing your plant consumption could could prevent about 11 million premature deaths every year. Wow. Um, and not that we're all going to live forever. Nobody's going to live forever. But what we can do is cut out the premature deaths from cardiovascular disease, from malignancies that are linked to food. Uh, and if people say, well, I'll take my chances, you may feel that way. But think about your loved ones. Right. Um, what we feed them affects their chances, too. I want to go back. You were talking about as far as the eye could see in North Dakota with these agricultural fields. This report that we're talking about here uh, stated that agriculture occupies 40 percent of the Earth's ice-free land mass. Mm -hmm. So of all the land, 40 percent of it goes to agriculture. That's almost half. That's right. And it, I guess people are really familiar with it in South America or Central America, where they hear about whole tracts of land being bulldozed down so that they can, can raise crops to feed uh, the cows or, or other animals mm -hmm. to, uh, for meat, because there's a growing appetite for meat. Um, but it's not, it's not true only there. It's true in North America. And if you imagine, what would it mean? What if people actually went to a plant-based diet, um, as so many people are doing? But if I could wave a magic wand and have everybody do that, the amount of land mass you would need for agriculture would be just a fraction of what it is now because you're not feeding all of those crops to animals. It, it's just amazing how all of that stuff kind of ties together. The health, the land, the environment, all of it really. I mean, it's it's kind of a – I hate to sound biased here. That's not what I'm trying to do with this show. But really, I mean, it sounds kind of like a, a can't-miss thing to me. Well, you know, you mentioned bias. It's – you know, when, when people were studying tobacco – they didn't want to be biased initially, back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Say, I want to give tobacco an honest test. Does it cause lung cancer or bladder cancer or, or emphysema and so forth? But there comes a point when you realize the evidence is really so enormously strong. And I think people legitimately debated whether um, agriculture was affecting the environment mm -hmm. up until some years ago when it became absolutely incontrovertible. Right. Um, people debated uh, would diet affect your heart? Would it affect cancer risk? Until it became obvious. Right. So at this point, there isn't anybody who is looking sensibly at the evidence who can't conclude that a plant-based diet really will save lives. It really will help the environment. It really is the best choice. We've we've said greenhouse gas emissions. We've said same save the environment, but we haven't touched on two very critically important words that go along with that, and those words are climate change. And I'm just hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about the direct impact that these greenhouse gases would have then if we reduce them on slowing down climate change. Yes, well, that would happen. And right now, we've got a long way to go. And if you took all the cows that are in North America, you put them on one side of a balance, and you put all the people on the other side of the <laughs> balance, you know, each cow, there's maybe... 90 million of them, something like that in the United States. But each one is as big as a sofa. Mm. Um, and so the mass of cows is bigger than the mass of people. And each cow is belching out methane. Um, by the way, for people who are wondering which end of the cow it goes out of, it's, it's coming out their mouth. It's, they, they are ruminating and they're, they're, they belch out methane and they put out a lot of it. Wow. So imagine, uh, if you have a glass of milk, that came from a dairy. That dairy doesn't have two or three cows on it. It's an enormous operation. For sure. And it is a methane factory. If you had a, a, a steak, 
Um, that didn't come from some cow who happened to get hit by a car somewhere. That came from a factory that is producing methane. And there are factories, they call them factory farms, they're all over the United States producing methane. If we could shut that down by deciding, I want the plant-based choice, you're shutting down this enormous source of greenhouse gas production. Methane, like carbon dioxide and others, is a greenhouse gas. The difference is that methane is far more potent. Right. Right. And it's coming out of animal agriculture. It's not the only source. Um, to raise all of those feed grains, of course, you need tractors. You need, you need fossil fuels to grow the, the feed that you're giving to the animals and so forth. So there are many, many other ways that animal agriculture contributes. But just the belching of methane alone, if, if nothing else, is a very, very significant source. Well, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up maybe and play devil's advocate here. I think that a skeptic then would say there's no way that a cow's burp could attribute so much or contribute so much to the erosion of, of the environment. But you're, you're citing cold, hard facts here. At this point, there is no question about it. Um, this has been reviewed over and over and over again. And I don't think that there is anybody now who seriously looks at the environmental science and isn't quite convinced that, A, methane, yes, it is a greenhouse gas. It is produced in enormous quantities. And animal agriculture is a bigger contributor to it than cars and trains and airplanes and transportation in general. Mm -hmm. There are other contributors, but animal agriculture is number one an enormous contributor, and number two, it's one that you can control. You can control it in your own life. You don't have to wait for a factory to cap its smokestacks. Um, it's something you can decide tomorrow morning. If you like what you just saw, you like what you just heard, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel and leave a nice comment below. And I also host a little show called the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee, filled with tons of research, tons of inspiration, new shows each and every Wednesday. Go ahead and subscribe now on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are available.